Shall we turn our Bibles to the last chapter of 2 Corinthians? 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 13, verses 1 to 13. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 13, verses 1 to 13. Uh, due to the shortage of time, let me just uh, skip to verse 5. It says, Examine yourselves to see whether you are living in faith. Prove yourselves. Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you fail to meet the test. And let me come to verse uh, 9. For we rejoice when we are weak and you are strong. This is what we pray for, that you may become perfect. And again, coming to verse 11, finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice, be perfect, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. We have been trying to understand the two letters of the Apostle Paul, the Church of Corinth, throughout the past one year. And today we have reached the last chapter of Second Corinthians. Let me begin with these verses, verses 9 and verse 11. Paul says, last part of verse 9, this is what we pray for, that you may become perfect. And verse 11, Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice, be perfect. Now, these two verses summarize the whole purpose of the Apostle Paul in his writings to the Corinthians. The whole aim of the, of the letters to Corinthian churches, Corinthian church, the whole aim of Paul's communication in the Corinth was the perfection of the saints in that church. It was not to acquire some material world that he wrote this letter. It was not to attain some of his goals in life that he wrote these letters. He was concerned of the perfection of these people. You know, the relationship that Paul had with the Corinthian church was rocky and, a, and was a rough one, but even in the midst of all painful experience, Paul's desire for them was their perfection. And when we think about perfection, uh, we think about people who are perfectionists. They want to do everything perfect, everything right. No mistakes, no uh, false life. That's a good thought, but the meaning that Paul meant by the word perfect was a little bit different. And what does it mean? It was a specific and also a descriptive word. We see this word in Matthew chapter 4, verse 21, where it goes, Going from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Sabari, and his brother John, they were in a boat with their father Sabali, preparing their nets. You know this word, preparing. The Greek word for preparing here, and the word for perfection there in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, is the same word. I can explain with an example. Back in India, there's a creek near my house. In that creek we have small fishes and as a young child, as a young kid, I used to go and catch fish with, catch fish with my friends. But there is a time in the year when big fishes from the river or the lake swim up to this small creek in our place. And the people of our locality, they all know about this time, the rainy season, where all these big fishes swim up to these creeks. And during those days, all the older people of, those, uh, of our place, they all go 
to these creeks to catch these big fishes. These fishes are coming their legs and they will return in a few days. So people will catch them while they return. And my grandfather, he used to uh, go along with the other people to catch fish. And he had a special kind of net. So he go and catch this fish and then he come back. And the next day when I'm coming back, when, when I come back from school, I see him working on the net. He is just uh, doing certain small things. Now he is examining the net and slowly taking every layer of the net and slowly connecting it up wherever there is certain area that is broken down. There are certain times when sharp material or sharp wooden branches or something go into this net and break the net. So what my grandfather used to do, he usually tie it down. He makes all these things right. He repairs the net. That was the same thing that the apostles uh, James uh, and uh, John were doing when Jesus was calling them for ministry. They were repairing that net. They were preparing and they were repairing that net. The apostle Paul was telling these people in the church of God in the same message. Friends, you need to repair. You need to prepare. You need to be perfect. Sure for perfection, but that progress, the way in which you go towards perfection is by preparing yourself to repair certain things in your life. That's what the apostle is telling them. Prepare. Be perfect. Shoot towards perfection. And now, I want to draw your attention to certain imperative statements that this man of God pointed out in this passage. He pointed out certain things and he commanded them to do this. It's not just suggestion, it's not just his opinion, it was telling them in a commanding way and imperative to do this. What will things you all do? In verse 5 it says, examine yourself. Morning, I was in the school. I heard the same statement made by Pastor Paul. The suffering the same thing. Examine yourself. We, we know Paul in his writings, he uh, he always says this statement. If you look at uh first Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28, in relation to the Lord's Supper, he says, Let a man examine yourself. And also in Galatians chapter 6, we see him saying in verse 4, but let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. Examine yourself. See, a Spurgeon in one of his sermons presented this theme of examining oneself in this way. Examine yourself as a professor examines a student and put him through his paces to see if he really knows what he ought to know. It's like examine yourself in the same manner as an original commander examines us through for the inspection day. He asks, examine yourself just like a traveler who travels to different countries and write to, wish to write a book from top to bottom, from border to border. He continues, examine yours in the same manner as, those, as that of a lawyer cross-examining a lying witness in the witness box, setting traps for him to try and find out the lie that is coming out from his mouth. Examine yours in that same manner. Paul tells them, friends, examine yourselves to see if there is something wrong in your life. See that if something wrong happens with your Christian life. Examine themselves and see if they are in faith. That was another theme that Paul was presenting them. You have to examine yourselves to see if you are in faith. Look to your own life and see 
Did you change in certain areas how you were towards an experience? And are you still continuing in that new life or did you go back to that old way of life? Are we still in faith? The other day I was uh, talking to Robinson's dad and I was calling another man of God and we were still in. Many so called believers are like ceiling fans. The peculiarity of the ceiling fan is that if you, switch, if you turn it off, still it's, it's continuing its rotation. Many have lost the power source, the connection with the power source. Still, on the basis of past experience, or in line with the previous momentum, they act as spiritual. For still in, or asking the Corinthian church, are you still in faith or are you just in acting according to the moment? Examine our private life. What do we do or what do we think when we try alone? The first command that the Apostle Paul was giving them, examine yourself. Then he says, prove yourselves. You have seen many electronic charges coming with a seal tested okay. The manufacturers of the quality control departments test it and seal it saying we tested it and it is ready to work. Paul is telling your friends, you need to examine yourselves and prove yourselves that you are in faith. Have you noticed uh, sometimes when you give a hundred dollar bill, the cash in the counter of a store, department store, draw a line with a special kind of marker on that note? They are checking the bill for its authenticity. They want to know if it is real or fake. If the line stays light colored, it is probably authentic. If not, it is to be suspicious. Personally, friends, understand this through your verses. Draw a line, use that marker, the word of God, and see. The word of God is pointing or pricking your conscience of certain things. Let that marker, word of God, work in your life and point out your fallacies. Let the word of God prove that you are genuine or you are counterfeit. Matthew chapter 7, 17, Jesus says, A good tree produces good fruit and a bad tree produces bad fruit. Just what kind of a fruit are we producing? Are we producing the fruit of the spirit or are we producing the fruit of the flesh? To the morning, the command that is given to you and I is to examine ourselves and prove that we are in faith. There are people who go and visit our physicians. They go all over there. The nurse will take your temperature. They'll check your blood pressure. They'll ask a lot of questions. Do you have appetite? Do you have pain here? Do you have this problem? Do you have that, that problem? Yes, the word of God is telling us that you are not going to be examined by somebody else, but you have to examine yourself with a lot of questions. What's your temperature? Let me put it in line with the message was charged in the world this year in Revelations. God was telling or asking, are you hot or are you cold? Or are you lukewarm? You remember a sermon I made some time back? The seven churches in the province of Asia. And that I said, there were two kinds of spring near to the city of Lamodicia. Hot springs and cold springs. The water in those springs were useful. But the water that they were receiving in Lamodicia was lukewarm water. It was poison. It was not at all good for them. Pointing towards that instance, the Spirit of God was asking them, Are you cold or are you hot or are you lukewarm? 
if you are born or called, you are useful for some people or you are useful in the church of God, you are useful in the kingdom of God, but if you are lukewarm, you are not good for nothing. You are good only to be spit out. We need to examine our words. Are we useful? What is our duration? Are we hot or are we cold or are we warm? Is, is our spiritual heart who is close to the sin? Is our spiritual heart is pumping hard against the sinful ways? What's our appetite? You hide the word of God in our heart. How is your digestion? Are we applying the word of God? And what if we need to answer these questions as we examine ourselves and prove ourselves? So, so that we may repair ourselves and prove our faith and move forward to a way of progress. The whole purpose of a self-examination and a proof of faith. As you say, friends, in that way towards perfection, you and I need to examine ourselves. You and I need to prove ourselves. Now coming to verse 11, we see animal set up in parading statements, certain commands. He still finally brothers and sisters with joy, be perfect, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace. Paul says rejoice. In Philippians chapter, in all these chapters, over and over again, Paul says rejoice. The Lord is the source of our strength and the source of our joy. God has given us salvation. He has given us freedom. He has given us all the blessings that are needed in our lives. And we are supposed to rejoice in the Lord. Now what happened to the Corinthian church? Or what happened to many Christians as the days go by? The joy of the salvation got down. The joy of the salvation, the joy that they had in the beginning of their Christian life is no more. The joy only disappeared. Now faith is really showing a sad situation. To like Paul, when he was writing this, he was writing from a prison. He was an imprisonment and he says rejoice. The morning word of God is telling us, friends, you need to come back to that joy. For our electronic gadgets, there's a button called restore. A button where we press, just restore it to a factory setting. The morning, the man of God is telling us, press that button to restore our spiritual life. Click the restoration button so that we may come back to that joy. Remember in, the, in our last uh, church camp on a Sunday morning, uh, Shajin gave us some balloons. Likewise, in the Presbyterian conference, People were given uh, helium balloons and told to release them at some point of the service when they felt like expressing their joy in their hearts. All through the conference, a few of the balloons were released, but most of the balloons were kept there, tied on those chairs. Even after attending a service, even after listening to the preaching, even, even after singing and praising God, they don't feel happy with Him. In the morning, let me ask you, are you happy with Him? Do you have the joy? Do you have the peace in your mind? Do you rejoice in the presence of God? Are you still keeping a gloomy face? Yes, life is full of challenges. There are a lot of struggles. There are a lot of problems. Look at Paul. He was going through tremendous trouble. His life is on the verge of collapsing. He is almost to the, uh, uh, approaching a point of death. Still, he is like, 
in that prison he writes, rejoice, rejoice, and again I say rejoice. The morning when our God is pointing us to restore or click that restoring button to come back, to come back, to come back to that old joy. Moving further, he says, be perfect, as we are already examined that word. Then he says, be of good comfort. Now, the church, they were listening to a lot of sermons, they were singing a lot of songs, but they were not comforted within. Their approach is whatever. Paul saying, no friends, come back to that previous enthusiasm of the world. Come back to that previous enthusiasm of the Lord. Take that encouragement. Moving further, he says, agree with one another. Be of one mind. Two men were riding a bicycle, a built for two. And when they reached a steep hill, they were trying their level best to reach the top of that hill. And when they were almost done, the friends were saying, man, that was a really hard climb. And his friend was sitting in the back, he was like, Yes, if I hadn't keep the brakes on all the way, we would certainly have rolled down backwards. Somebody is pushing hard to the front and somebody is applying the brake. That was happening in the Corinthian church. He was telling friends, be of one mind. This is not you are so, it is a show of God. It is not our performance, but we are worshipping God. It is nothing to deal with our individual matters. It is all about God. So in Corinthians, the apostle in the beginning, it's on the outside itself, he says in verse 10, I appeal to you brothers in the name of Lord Jesus Christ that all of you agree one another so that, agree with one another so that, there may be no division among you that you may be perfectly united in the mind and thought. And now coming to verse, uh, coming to the 12th chapter, 13th chapter of 2nd Corinthians, Paul is like, say, like, friends, express that unity by means of a holy kiss. Unity, that was a major aspect of the prayer of Jesus. In John chapter 17, verse 22, he says, I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. Let's continue in one mind to do the work of the Lord. And finally, he comes to the next uh, command, live in peace. What does it mean to have peace in church? What does aiming for peace look like in the body of Christ? Just one percentage from James chapter 3, 13 to 18. It says like this, who is wise and understanding among you, let him show it by his good life, by deeds done in the humility, and goes on and on. Let me tell you, on the basis of those verses we can derive, peace means doing this in humility. Peace means not harboring bitterness and self-ambition. Peace means accepting the truth when it comes. Peace means relying on heavenly wisdom. Peace, peace means harvesting righteousness. Pause like friends. Live in peace. Paul's whole desire throughout this letter, all through his communication, his painful message was the repairing, was the preparing and the further perfection of the saints in Corinth. They were a group of people with a whole lot of limitations. To them Paul didn't say the grace of God is there to cover up your faults. He said, examine your first and take the right steps in life. Strive hard for the perfection. Take every effort to repair, to restore certain things. And 
that will only take you to another level, another high spiritual level in your lives. 